welcome back. So yesterday, Inging, you were saying and singing about how you'd be a romantic until the day you died. Yes, that's right. If life doesn't include love, is it even worth living? Well, that's indeed a question that philosophers have pondered and obsessed over in countless ways for millennia. So it's probably not going to go away anytime soon. But when we're trying to better understand each other's ingrained assumptions about love and romance and dating and marriage and all that stuff, it's important to underline the fact that a nation or culture's history has a massive influence on how it views all of the above. Exactly. And when looking at these things in China, in particular, the last one hundred years. Of history have specially influenced the dating traditions of today. On this episode, we'll talk about that, namely how reactions to rapidly changing times in China's recentish history, roughly from the end of the Qing Dynasty, has energized the huge series of cycles ever since. We will discuss how the transition from traditional to modern values has left some younger people caught in the gears of family concerns versus their own more personal ones. Dating and marrying for the sake of love alone is luxury that people didn't always have. And speaking of luxury, we'll look at why high material status is so valued here now when it comes to dating. What up with that, Inging? Are you a material girl? Patience. More in the moment. <laughs> All right, regular listeners of the show here have figured out that some shows are BD heavy and some are inging heavy. Guess which one this is going to be, folks. So, are you ready to do most of the talking today, Inging? I've had my coffee and ready to rock. Awesome! That is spoken like a true modern millennial person, I must say. But not that long ago, the odds of your counterpart from just a few decades back would probably not be able to relate. What would a talented thirty-year-old woman from Kaifeng, China's romantical life, look like, say, thirty years ago? Well, to start with, there's almost no way she would be single. Dating back then was still totally focused on marriage, and she would probably have been married in her early to mid twenties. And she'd be chasing around a couple of kids and trying to manage a household while her husband was off work. Okay, so she'd have a husband. What qualities would she look for most? You think? Would she care about his views on, say, entrepreneurship or the environment or the、uh, impact of globalization on traditional cultures, like you might? Not exactly. She'd be more concerned with him giving her items that were relative luxuries at the time, like a bicycle, or sewing machine, or a watch. But it's nothing like it is today. Makes sense. But the roots of what is considered traditional Chinese dating culture can be traced back even farther to roughly the end of the Qing Dynasty. What were the priorities back like then, about a hundred years ago? The guiding principles that passed directly from the Qing Dynasty had a big importance on ceremony in general, and where marriage was concerned, it was the ritualistic ceremonial. Aspects that were most important, not the feels part. <laughs> the bond between a man and a woman in a couple was more focused on respect than romantic love. It is that concept of san gang wu chang again. Ah, shout out to our man Confucius. Pretty much, as we know in the modern era, love means choosing who you want to be with for love's sake. But back in the day, it was much more focused on having responsibility to your family. There wasn't the freedom to just follow your heart.、Mm. Honoring your family meant honoring the traditional ceremony of life, which pays respect to Confucianism, as well as this concept Li that we talked about in episode three. Ah,、uh, right, right, right. So from the 1930s all the way up to the opening up of 78, there was such a wild mix of influences on China's national psyche, including demographic shifts, revolutionary changes, invasions and wars, and so many other deep impacts, all of which were heavily intertwined, that the concept of dating and love culture was based in kind of a survival mode. The scientific view of the proper woman's role in the family in the early times was a reaction to all of these societal changes you just mentioned. It was assumed that a woman should stay at home and raise babies in order to recover from conflicts, to help the nation to heal and become strong, etc. Giving birth became something you did for the purpose of aiding the country, and raising strong families throughout a large society requires a common agreement or social contract about what that means. And for a long time, there was agreement, but things start changing, and they still are. In the U.S., there were massive shifts in the late '40s to early 1950s that likewise affected our development, just in a pretty different way. 
During World War II, women in the U.S. took on roles in industry while the men were all fighting for our and China's freedom along with other nations, and then during the post-war period in the U.S., gender roles shifted back towards more of a so-called traditional model of our own, but the seeds had been planted for women's liberation. Mm. And from the 1970s onward, the forces of social change in the U.S. saw women gaining new ground in terms of taking leadership roles and claiming their independence. Now, these changing attitudes created economic shifts as well as home life ones. Now, of course, a detailed look at post-war U.S. history is a topic for mm-hmm. another show and probably on another podcast entirely. But for the sake of this show, Inging, how did China's more traditional history, which was lived and is still felt by the parents of 30-somethings even today, evolve to where we are in these present times? As we've said, in the past, dating was very simple. Arranged introductions were very common, and there were both less attractions and disattractions for people in the earlier eras. Yeah, they didn't have iPhones or anything like Tinder to pull their eye away from whoever was right in front of them, did they? Of course not. Dating was for marriage, and not just for pleasure. Marriage was the whole point. But it shifted again after opening up. The economy developed so fast that everything changed. This is where the commercialization crept in, right? Mm-hmm. Standards of living and earning reset all the old expectations. So instead of a bike and sewing machine being sufficient, girls and their families started asking for cars and a house to prove someone's newly required level of status and stability. But this greater personal freedom, which also led to the rise of feminism and different classes in Chinese society, also created one of its biggest challenges right now, the sex ratio imbalance. Now, this makes it harder for the so-called less desirable men, those without sufficient income, education, or portfolio, to marry. But there are still plenty of men who check all those right boxes, yet they are still single against their will. Inging, how did we end up with this concept of leftover women, quote-unquote, when there is such a huge imbalance of men? Well, for one thing, those women are generally more educated, so they are both culturally choosier and more independent. Girls have options they never had before, and the term is pretty insulting to them. Most of them are not leftover. They're single by choice. That's right. The independent women I know in their 30s and 40s, here or elsewhere, are often some of the best ones I've met. I don't get why they'd be considered less valuable by anyone, frankly. Well, you know that Chinese men do love younger women. Uh, I hate to break it to you, but everybody loves younger women. It doesn't mean that we don't like older women, too, but just saying. I have no official comments. Probably a wise choice for me sometimes, too. Also, the internet has brought ever-increasing options to all of us. But in some areas, the practice of xiangqin is still common. What's that? That means dating arranged by the parents, with the idea that it will lead to marriage. Uh, I've seen some of those videos of the markets where old people are trading pictures of their kids (laughs) like baseball cards. Seems like it creates a lot of drama, but it's fun to watch at least. Does it ever have good results, though? Well, it can, depending on what a man or woman want out of life. There's a stew type of guy here called Zhinan. Basically, it means that they want to find submissive girls. Ooh. One who will be subordinated to him. Maybe they have better luck finding them there. Uh, okay, it's my take that men like that who subscribe to this philosophy cannot allow a stronger or more successful woman to rule him. Someone like you. Is there a more enlightened counterpart to this poor fellow? Yes, a man who feels the opposite way is called Nuan Nan. Uh, that's a caring, more empathetic man. Mm-hmm. You see those boyfriends who are happy to carry the girlfriend's purse when they are shopping in the mall? Those <laughs> couples who really take care of each other. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's more publicly obvious aspect of Nuan Nan, but it's both more subtle and goes much deeper than that. Oh, I think that's kind of sweet. But my girlfriend's bag is pretty heavy. I'm afraid she's on her own with it. You are such a romantic. Uh, I try, I try. So, what are some other influences on the shifting realities here in the dating and romance world? Well, now that China has moved on from the one-child policy to encouraging higher birth rate, families will have more of them. But that does explain why people in their 20s and early 30s who were born under that policy still often have to take their family needs into more consideration. This means that one child often has to raise four parents, wow. theirs in-laws. So it's a big responsibility. No doubt. Well, someone has to help carry on the lineage and provide elder support, so that makes sense. But how did this seeming overemphasis on materialism get solidified? Now, of course, coming from Hollywood, I can't exactly be one to judge, but the amount of luxury you see here in the major cities is kind of staggering. 
I mean, I live in a nice middle-class building, but there are freaking Mybox in the parking garage. Wow. Porsches are as common as Peugeots in a lot of neighborhoods. Well, it's ironic to say that because as economic development and that West influence grow, especially after the opening up of the 70s, so did the importance of material positions here. Having some really nice things provides a feeling that kids and a family will be extra secure too. China has had a really rough ride to get where we're today. So many of the old poor country feelings remain deep inside. Once we overcome those, we will truly have reached another level. Level. But again, that's a story for another episode. Sounds great. Thanks, Ying Ying. Today was a pretty philosophical show, but I think that reflects the nature of the topic, don't you? Yep. To understand the differences between societies, you have to understand their histories and the impacts of those histories on the people's development. Understanding this will help you to increase empathy when looking at dating differences between cultures, and it will help you better resolve and avoid conflicts too. As we move into the future, women are becoming more emotionally as well as financially independent. Big changes are happening, and we're not all totally in harmony yet. But soon enough, attitudes toward love here will better line up with the rest of the world. We just have to catch up a little with each other and be patient. I think that's great advice all around. So what's up next, Ingi? Next, we'll jump into the difference in online dating between East and West. Ooh, This right. should be a really fun topic. <laughs> I think so too. One that we'll talk about tomorrow in great detail. Hello, Cupid and Tinder and Wamwa, etc. So join us then. I'm Brendan Davis, and I'm Ingi. See you tomorrow on How China Works. Hey.